Today we're going to talk about some more things about the kingdom. And in the passage that we have before us in Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 22, uh, we are dealing with a passage of scripture that we've just simply uh, entitled Dealing with the Devil. How did Jesus deal with the devil? A lot of things I want to cover today, so uh, pull out your Bibles, uh, maybe even your notepad, sit up on the edge of your seat, pay attention. We're going to move fairly quickly, and there's some things here that you're going to want to hear about. In Isaiah 43, verse 10, the Bible says, Before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. So we all believe in one God, right? But isn't it fascinating that the Bible tells us in Exodus 12, verse 12, God declares that he will execute judgments on all the gods of Egypt. And then in verse 11, uh, chapter 15, verse 11, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Deuteronomy 20, beginning of verse 16, they will teach you to, to follow all the detestable things they do in worshiping their gods, and you will sin against the Lord your God. Psalm 86, verse 8, there is none like you among the gods, O Lord. Psalm 96, verse 4, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods. Well, where do these gods come from? Who are these gods? Why does the Bible speak about gods, plural, little g, plural, and yet it also tells us that there is one God? God. God created angelic beings. If you'll read uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, uh, that is very evident. And there are other passages of Scripture that uh, talk about the fact that there was a whole host, uh, in some cases, and in fact, in one case, the word innumerable host is used to refer to angelic type beings. We read in the Word of God about the cherubim. Genesis chapter 3 verse 24 is the first place the Bible mentions that. doesn't mention the cherubim often, but there are a couple other places there. Psalm 18, Ezekiel 10. Also, the seraphim are mentioned in Isaiah chapter 6. So you have cherubim and seraphim. And when you read Isaiah chapter 6 about uh, just what little bit it says about the seraphim, it's kind of like one of those things you read it and you're like, oh, wow, what's that? And then you just hurry and turn the page and don't want to deal with it. So, uh, Psalm 82, verse 1 and verse 6, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Whoa! What is that? What is that? What is that even talking about? Let's read it again. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Then just keep on down to verse 6. I said, you are gods, sons of the most high. Well, what do you do with that? All of you, nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. And so some people would, oh, well, those are just kings and princes. Those are people. Well, if they are people, if they're human beings, why did he say in verse 6, you are going to die like men? If they were men, he would have no reason to say you're going to die like men. So they were not men. In fact, we'll refer to this later, but in Daniel chapter 10, we read about the Michael the archangel, some angelic being, uh, responds to Daniel's prayer. He's been praying for three weeks. An angelic being appears to him and says, Whew, I heard your prayer a long time ago, but uh, I'm just now getting around to get to you because I've been real busy. You see, me and Michael the archangel, we have been fighting with the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece, and I'm just now able to, to come and, and, and talk to you. What is that? Who are the king of Persia and the king of Greece? Well, they're not people because 
Isaiah tells us in, in, in one instance, an angel of God killed 185,000 soldiers in one night. Okay? So whoever the king of Prince or the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece are, they're not people. Because these angels of God, including the chief angel, Michael, they are struggling, they're fighting with these individuals. We'll come back to that later. You shall have no other gods before me. Right off the bat, when God gives the Ten Commandments, uh, that's what he says. You shall have no other gods before me. Uh, an interesting passage in 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 13, when Saul wanted to call, he went to uh, uh, the, uh, the witch, the whatever you want to call her, uh, to bring up the spirit of Samuel, who was deceased. Uh, and, and whenever she did, she asked Saul, what do you see? And he said, I saw gods. And then he saw Samuel. So who are all these gods? Well, I believe that the Bible is explaining to us through these and other passages that we're going to look at that these are angelic beings that oversee the nations. Well, you might ask at this point, well, why in the world are you getting into all of this when you're supposed to be talking about Matthew chapter 12, uh, verse 22 through 35? Well, because I think it's important for us to understand something about the spirit world. We need to understand something about the source of evil. We need to understand what we're dealing with and who we are dealing with. We need to understand who Jesus was dealing with in this passage. And so I just wanted to go back and look in the Word of God and find the source. Let's see the background information. Let's see uh, where all of this comes from. So let's go back to Psalm 82. Remember verse 6 said, I said you are gods and all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like, the one, like one of the princes. Daniel 10 that we referred to has Michael fighting with the princes of Persia and Greece. Then in chapter 12 verse 1, Michael the great prince who has charge of your people. Ever see that? Isn't that an interesting statement? Michael, who has charge of your people. Let's continue. Jude, verse 6 and 7. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. All right, so at this point, I think we can infer from everything that we've read that there are supernatural beings that God addresses in Psalm 82, and they were appointed to rule over the nations. But they had failed in their task. Read all of Psalm 82, and you will see all the accusations that God makes against these, who he calls gods, the sons of the Most High. And so we look at some of these other passages and we see this prince of the kingdom of Persia, the prince of the kingdom of Greece. We see Michael ruling over the people of God. And so what we're beginning to see is this idea that certain high-level angelic beings were over certain countries. They were overseeing certain nations or peoples. We find more about this in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Verse 8 and 9 says, when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God, but the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. Now we read this phrase, sons of God, and the first time we come across that is way back in Genesis chapter 6. You remember that strange passage that says, the sons of God married the daughters of men. And all of that, their progeny were giants, the Bible says. That's where Goliath came from. They were giants. There are a number of giants. In fact, it's uh, kind of interesting 
to go back in the Old Testament and look at all the numbers of times that there are references to giants in the Old Testament. Over, I think there's around like 25 to 30 references of giants in the Old Testament. Where do these giants come from? Who are these giants? Uh, one Og, I believe it was, that said his bed was 13 feet or uh, 13 feet or 13 cubits long, whatever it was. If it was cubits, it was more like 20 feet. So anyway, we got all of these strange things in the Word of God, and they're just look, let's just get down and face it. They're parts of the Bible we just read it and flip over and we just don't want to deal with it and so that's kind of what I'm talking about today some of those places all right so all of that this, these uh, sons of God these angelic beings who fell evidently based on Jude 6 and 7 where they left their place that God had given them they left or undermine the authority of God and all of that it has to do with the fact that they went to the daughters of men and had sexual relations and from that they had children who were giants now there's a lot of Jewish history that you can read about and most I mean, over and over and over, you find in ancient Jewish writings that they believed that the spirits of these giants, when they died, now remember, you're, you're combining angelic beings with human beings, and so when they died, that's where demons come from. The spirits of these deceased progeny of the sons of God and the daughters of men that's where this all came from that's where the demons came from don't know for sure about that but there is a lot of uh, extra biblical evidence in Judaism that points to that at least that's what the Jews believed may sound pretty weird to us far out there to us because some of us may have come from a a background to where uh, I, I can honestly remember, I truly remember uh, as a young man, as a child, hearing discussions uh, among some people that uh, I went to church with of whether or not they believe that angels exist. So, this is a long way from that. Now, if you read Deuteronomy 32 carefully, you cannot help but think about Genesis chapter 11, chapters 10 and 11. Before I go there, though, I just want to point out that these gods are probably the principalities, powers, rulers of this present darkness that Paul refers to in Ephesians chapter 6 and other places in the book of Ephesians. So what happened? Remember, the earth got so corrupt, so wicked, so violent that God sent a flood to destroy all humanity except who was in the ark, right? But the spirits, the spirits of these lived on and they were cast into the pit. And that's what we read in Jude 6, verse 7, and they are reserved there under chains of darkness until the day of judgment. Now, in Deuteronomy 32, verse 12, the Bible says the Lord alone guided him. Now, he's talking about Israel. So you see what happened after the flood, after all that took place, after the whole issue with the dividing of the nations at the Tower of Babel, after all of that took place, all this evil, all this wickedness, God started and created, if you will, a new nation, a nation that did not exist. And he did so through Abraham. Through Abraham, he called Abraham, he made promises to Abraham, and Abraham and you know the story, that's where the nation of Israel came from. 
And so when he talks about him in Deuteronomy 32, 12, he's talking about Israel. He says, no foreign God was with him. Then look at verse 17. They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they had never known, to new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never dreaded. Deuteronomy 32, 21, they have made me jealous with what is no God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So you see there's a relationship between idolatry, the worship of idols and gods and demons. And that's the point I want to make. Behind idolatry, behind all of the so-called gods, These evil spirits, there are demons, there are evil spirits who are these princes, these gods, if you will. Now, people would build something and create something and give it a name, and they would worship that, but in all reality, they're not just worshiping stone or mortar or wood. They're not just worshiping a statue. There's something spiritual in the spirit realm going on behind all of this. There are evil beings who are trying to deflect worship and attention and loyalty away from God onto themselves. And that's what's behind all of this. And that's why when you go through the Old Testament... It's amazing all of the times you read about idolatry and how God disdains idolatry and how it frustrates and angers and disgusts him. So in Deuteronomy chapter 32, 21, they have made me jealous with what is no God. They have provoked me to anger with their gods. Now Genesis 11, 8 and 10, so the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of the earth. Now, in Acts 17, verse 26 and 27, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. So let me summarize briefly before we go on. What happened was that when God scattered the nations in Genesis chapter 11, God was angry with all of the nations. He's already destroyed everybody through the flood, and now after the flood, Over many years, all of the nations of the world, the whole population of the earth, now they are trying to basically do what Adam and Eve tried to do in the Garden of Eden. They were trying to bring God down to them. They were trying to bring themselves up to God. They were trying to have the wisdom and the knowledge and the power and the authority of God. That was what they were doing there in building that tower. They were... In fact, the Bible states plainly that they did this in order to make a name for themselves. So they're not honoring God. They're not worshiping God. They are focused on their own pride, their own adulation. So God scatters them, and God appoints these angelic beings to be over the nations. And these angelic beings... In their own desire, in their own pride, they forsook the place that God had given them and they desired worship for themselves. And so that's why by the time you get to the first century, you have Judaism and you have the Jews and then the rest of the world, right? The nations, the Gentiles. The Jews are the people of God. We are the nation of God. We are the family of God. We are God's children. And nobody else is. Well, that's, this is the history behind that. This is why 
things are that way in the first century. And so what God is doing then through Jesus is God is trying to regain the nations. God is now through the kingdom, through his kingdom, through the kingdom of the promised Messiah, through Jesus, God is retaking these fallen nations who fell because of all the things that, that happened. So, I don't know if that makes sense to you or not, but anyway, I want to elaborate on this just a minute and then we're going to uh, hurry on. Everybody remembers when the children of Israel go through the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and all of that because the first time when they got to the promised land, they came back and said, whoa, whoa, we can't go in there. There are giants over there. They're, we're like grasshoppers to them. We, there's no way we can overtake that land. And so God sent them into the wilderness to wander for 40 years. Well, at the end of the 40 years, Joshua and Caleb are the only ones left. And so what do they do? They're going to go in and take the land, right? Well, remember, the giants are still there, okay? Nothing's changed. The giants are there, and the Canaanites were there. The Canaanite nation were there. These were some of the gods and goddesses. Astarte or Ashtoreth, Ishtar, Venus, Aphrodite. Those are the, uh, the Greek and Roman names for them and all that. Baal was the supreme god. Baal means Lord. The sun god, the god of fertility and nature. Uh, you can read about the rituals and how uh, absurd and ridiculous all of that was. The sexual perversion associated with their religion. You read of Moloch, the fire god. Children were sacrificed to him to ensure financial prosperity and other things. And again, in Deuteronomy 32, 17, they sacrificed to demons. So behind these Canaanite gods are demons. And the wickedness was out of control. It was immense. And, you know, people say, well, I don't understand. How could God go in there and destroy the whole nation? How could he wipe out the women and children and all of that? I don't get that. I don't understand that. Well, that's why God told them to go in there and wipe out those nations because there was systemic, generational evil to the point of sexual perversion as worship and children being sacrificed to these gods. What's going on there is sickening. It is perverse. It is disgusting. It's about as far away from God as you can get. And it went on for generations. God was very patient. God finally had enough. God had a plan to put a stop to all of this. And so one of the first things that he's going to have to do is show that he has some kind of power and authority over them. And so his people go in there and wipe them out. So this is all very understandable. It shouldn't be a problem for us. And all of this continues on to the, the Greeks and the Romans, and, and we've got this quote here about uh, the way things were in the first century and under the Roman Empire and everything, and this writer says, things that had become centers of the wildest corruption, and innumerate, innumerable slaves from these countries had spread their immorality to Rome. Indeed, there was probably, there has probably never been a period when vice was more extravagant or uncontrolled than it was under the Caesars. Psalm 108, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Can you see why God wanted to get rid of that? So, we get to the New Testament. 
Satan is called the prince of demons, Beelzebub. That's what we're reading in, in Matthew 12 that we're looking at today. Beelzebub, Beel is a form of Baal. Remember, the word Baal simply means Lord, ruler of the earth. He was the supreme demon, if you will. In other words, Satan, another name for Satan. Baal, Beelzebub. Literally, that, for, that word means Lord of the Flies. John calls Satan the ruler of the world, the prince of the power of the air. Paul refers to him in Ephesians 2, 2, and calls him the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. Now, read those again. Does that ring a bell and make sense with everything I said about the nations and these fallen angels over the nations and the vile corruption and violence and wickedness that existed. And that's how Satan, when he met Jesus in the wilderness and tempted him, said, you bow down and worship me and I will give you all of these nations. It's all about the nations it's all about the people because the people of the world have followed Satan, followed the demons of hell. And that's why Satan is called the God of this world. And Jesus has come to overthrow him, overcome him, and defeat him. And so when Jesus won in the wilderness, when he defeated Satan, he showed that he is more powerful than the chief demon, the chief evil, the most wicked being that exists. Jesus can whip him. Now, I want to say something about holy ground versus unholy ground. Because we talked about the nations and, and borders and boundaries and princes and areas where angelic beings are over these countries, right? Well, to first century Jews, there were places you just didn't go. Why? Because it was unholy areas, unholy ground. The holy city was Jerusalem. The holy place was the temple. Why was that considered holy? Because that's where God dwelled, right? So wherever God does not dwell, it's unholy. Stay away from there. Why would you stay away from there? Why would you not go there? Why is that an evil place? Why is that a bad thing? Because God's not there. Well, if God's not there, who is there? All these principalities and powers and rulers, the spiritual forces of evil, that's who's there. That's why you don't go there. That's why Paul would tell the Corinthians in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 10, don't go into those pagan temples that you used to go to before you became a Christian. You don't go there. Why? Why not go there? What's wrong with it? I'm going to go to the party at the temple to this Greek god. No, 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 no. Don't go there. That's what Paul's telling them. Don't go there. Don't. You have no business going there. Why? Because there are evil places. And what God is doing is through Jesus, he's in the process of taking over the world. That's what God's doing. Sometimes it doesn't look like it. It's happening because there is a lot of evil. But that's what God is doing. And these verses on that first line, all of these verses tell us that the people of God, the church, are the temple of God. So, in the New Testament, the holy ground is the church. So wherever there are Christians, now I want you to think about this. We've already talked about these, back in the first century, it was Jerusalem, Judea, 
Israel, the people of God, and all the rest of the world are under the dominion of Satan, the God of this world. But now, 2,000 years later, Christianity is all over the globe. Think about that. God really is retaking the world. He really is. You can't hardly find a country where the kingdom of God is not there and people are not Christians. So everywhere the gospel is preached, everywhere people turn to Christ, every time someone becomes a Christian, Satan is being defeated and the kingdom of the devil is being overcome. It's important for us to keep that perspective when we get to thinking how bad things are and how wicked and how evil and there's so much around us. The truth is, in 2,000 years, there are people of God now all over the world. And it's still happening. So remember that. That's the holy ground. Wherever Christians are, that's where God lives. That's where God dwells. That's the holy ground. You remember that that passage in, in 1 Corinthians the guy who was having relations with his stepmother and all that uh, perversion, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5, turn him over to Satan. Basically, he was saying, excommunicate him, put him out of the church, put him away from yourselves. Well, that is turning him over to Satan. You know why? Because the church is the holy ground. If he's out of the church, he's not in the holy ground anymore. If he's away from the church, he's not with God anymore. Because that is the dwelling place of God. Now, you remember Matthew 16 when Jesus asked his disciples, you know, who do men say that I am? Some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, but who do you say I am? You remember that? And Peter made that confession, you are the Christ. You're the Messiah. Everybody remember that? Well, that took place at Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi has a very interesting history. In fact, you need to take the time to read about the history. It's a beautiful place. There's a big cave there, and it sits at the foot of Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is the tallest mountain in Israel. It's in the northernmost part of Israel, and and it is so high. Now think about how low, the, the lowest place in the world is in this area, okay? And Mount Hermon rises up over 9,000 feet above sea level in just a very short time from the Dead Sea. And Mount Hermon, even in the winter, for a short period of time, is the only place where the Israelites can go snow skiing. It's a snow-covered mountain. Google it. Look at the pictures. It's a beautiful mountain. But here's the thing about Caesarea Philippi and Mount Hermon. The people of the world had their high places. And that's not where they went to smoke pot. Their high places. What were the high places? The high places were on hills or mountains or wherever you were, whatever, wherever the highest place was, high places were holy places. The higher the place was, the holier that they believed it to be. And so since Mount Hermon was the highest place around, the pagans went there, and archaeological excavations at the foot of Mount Hermon has showed at least 20 shrines and temples that were at the foot of Mount Hermon. And in Caesarea Philippi, the Greeks considered that was the birthplace of the god Pan. And so at Caesarea Philippi, there's this massive rock, this huge cliff, and there is a cave in the cliff. And you can go in that cave, and it is so deep that the ancients believed it to be a bottomless pit. 
a bottomless pit. And so they built this shrine to the god Pan. Then Herod the Great comes along in the, in the first century, and he builds a huge temple to Caesar. And so they renamed him, they give Caesar, Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi. And so this place was not a holy place as far as Jews were concerned. This, my friends, was a bad, bad place evil place you don't go there and that's where Jesus took his disciples and that's where Jesus said who do you say I am I believe Jesus went there on purpose he went there on purpose he essentially was taunting the demons of hell right in their own backyard. In that country, in that area, the southernmost part of that area, that's where that story about Legion occurred. Remember? Legion with all the demons, and Jesus drives the demons out of Legion into the, the 2,000 pigs, and they run down the cliff and drown. Everybody remember that? Preached on it not very long ago. That happened in that region. What was Jesus doing? Why did he go over there? Why did he do that? Why did he drive them into the pigs? All of that. Because the pigs represent the filth, the uncleanness, the evil of the nations and those fallen angelic beings who were over those nations and had corrupted them and all the violence all of that. And Jesus walks in their own backyard, drives the demons out, sends them into the pigs and the pigs drown in the water. What's he doing? He's showing, I am Lord here. Not Baal. Not these princes. Not these demons. I am Lord here. This is my place, my land, my country, and I'm here to take it. That's what Jesus was doing. Mount Hermon, I said it was at the foot of Mount Hermon. Many scholars have argued over the years of where the transfiguration took place. More and more scholars have come to believe now based on the text of Scripture and the geographical location of where events happen and all that, that the transfiguration actually took place on Mount Hermon. Now, wouldn't that be something? Is that not more in, in the devil's face? The only place where Jesus shows his divine glory, he goes up on that mountain. He goes up on that mountain and he is changed in a moment. He is changed and he is glorified right there, at the highest place, the holy place, the place where the demons are worshipped. And Jesus goes in there and shows who he is and shows his authority. So Paul's worldview was one of rulers, principalities, powers, dominions, thrones, world rulers, the spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience, demons, evil spirits, unclean spirits, all of that kind of thing. So Jesus drove out some demons in Matthew 12. Can Christians be demon-possessed? That's what you really want to know, isn't it? You want to know, can a Christian be demon-possessed? And the answer, emphatically, is no way, Jose. It ain't going to happen. Okay? There's no way. And here's why. Number one, that's a misunderstanding. Demon possession is a, a total misunderstanding. There is not a single Greek word that means possessed or owned by the devil. That's just all English translations and interpretations and all of that. Okay? So relax a little bit here. Secondly, the Bible says that the church has been purchased has been bought 
by the blood of Christ. Acts 20, verse 28. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. If you're a Christian, you are owned or possessed by Jesus. Okay? You're possessed by Jesus. You have the Holy Spirit living in you. Get that negative, pathetic thinking out of your mind that somehow allows a demon to possess you because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And there's no room for a demon to live in the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's holy ground. You see? No demons in holy ground. Furthermore, Colossians 1.13 says, we've been delivered from the kingdom of darkness and placed in Jesus' kingdom of light. The Greek word literally actually means demonized. So what does that mean to be demonized? Can a Christian be so influenced as to give themselves to sin in some degree? Yeah, sure can. We can sin. To some degree or another or another or another, Christians can do that. Can a Christian surrender to sin? I think we've seen that. You can surrender, you can give yourself over to sin. If that's what you want to do, if that's where you want to go, if that's the way you want to live, you can do that. Can one come under the power of sin? Anybody know what an addict is? Sure, you can come under the power of sin. You just keep on sinning, you just keep going there, you keep doing that, and guess what? You'll be under the power of sin. So sin can still affect a Christian, okay? That doesn't mean the devil owns you. Ephesians 4, 7 speaks of giving opportunity to the devil. 1 Timothy 4, 1, in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. 2 Timothy 2, 5, or 26 talks about those who are taken captive by him. So here's the thing. There's holy ground and there's unholy ground. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 says that a child of God does not need to get all mixed up with a child of the devil. He asks a series of rhetorical questions that basically say, what business do you have getting all mixed up with someone who is not a Christian. You hear what I'm saying? Read it. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Read those first several verses there. And why? Why would God say such a thing? Well, I'm going to tell you why. Because God cares for you. Please understand, there are things you can do, there are places you can go, there are activities that you can involve yourself in that are dangerous. And you may think, ah, oh, I'm strong enough, I can handle that, don't worry about me, I'm going to do what I want to do. You know, there's all kinds of attitudes out there, all kinds of attitudes. But God tells us there is such a thing as evil. There are demonic beings. There are evil, satanic beings that have power and influence. And if you go there, if that's the direction you want to go, if you get involved with that, it can overtake you. I'm going to use one example real quickly. Pornography. Pornography. When I put the slide up about the Canaanites and the god and goddesses of the, of the Canaan, Canaanites, and then you all, we do a whole sermon on Ephesus and, and 
in the go goddess Diana, Artemis, in the temple there, they said there were a thousand prostitutes that lived in that temple. A thousand prostitutes. Sexual perversion was rampant in the name of worshiping and honoring this goddess. Okay? Now that's, that's messed up. That's weird. And people say, well, we don't worry about that. We don't have any shrines to uh, a, a goddess of fertility today. I don't bow down to anything. Let me tell you something. If you're addicted to pornography, you are bowing down to a power, an authority, an evil that is much deeper and broader and badder than you can ever imagine. You're messing with the devil. And that's not something to play with. Even the Apostle Paul said, to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh. Everybody, we talk about the thorn. What was the thorn in the flesh? What? A messenger of Satan to harass me. You see that? Satan came after the Apostle Paul. That thorn in the flesh, we, I don't know exactly what it was. Was it an eye problem? Was it a speech impediment? Well, what was it? What was it? Well, I don't know this, but the Bible says it came from the devil. What? Yeah. First Peter 5, verse 8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. How do demons attack humans? Sin, physical maladies, including sickness and disease, mental illness, emotional upheaval, persecution. Examples of inflictions caused by demons in the scripture include skin disease, deafness and inability to speak, blindness, insanity, destructive and irrational acts, epileptic-like seizures, tormenting pain. The Bible says that demonic spirits cause these things. Now, that doesn't mean that every sickness is from a, a demon, okay? It doesn't mean that every one of these things that happen to every time to anybody, that doesn't mean that that's necessarily from a demon. I'm just telling you the Bible says the devil can do these things. Okay? That's all I'm saying. Now, I got the wrong verse up there. It's supposed to be Luke 10, verse 18. I don't know how that got there. I made a, uh, I messed up. But in Luke 10, verse 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. The inauguration of Jesus' kingdom meant the beginning of the end for the ruler of the world and the kingdom of sin and death. And like I said, when the gospel is preached, demons were driven out. It goes right along with it. When you read the gospel, when, everywhere, when the gospel's preached, Jesus drives out demons, Jesus heals sickness. They go right hand in hand because he's showing his power over Satan. If Satan is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? You say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, how do your own sons cast them out? Therefore, they'll be your judges. But if it's by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters abroad. Satan is the strong man. But one more powerful has broken into his house. Jesus broke into the house of the devil. Jesus came to the world, and Jesus is coming to defeat Satan. And through his death and resurrection on the cross, he's already overcome death. He's overcome death, and Satan is headed for an eternal death in the pits of hell. That's where Satan's headed. And all his minions, all the demons, 
all of them are going to be defeated and they're going to be destroyed forever and ever. So we really don't have to worry about them except for the fact that their influences are all around us while we're in this flesh and in this life. And we need to be vigilant. We need to be sober-minded. We need to pay attention. We need to see the reality of what's happening. But in our text, one last question. Can a Christian be guilty of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Because in Matthew 12 that we're looking at, that's where that passage is. Again, the answer is no. If you look at the context here, the Pharisees had rejected the healing work and power of Jesus by attributing it to the work and power of Satan. Jesus characterized them as bad trees with bad fruit and evil hearts. Their speech had come from the evil, unbelieving hearts. Such a person could not be called a Christian. Those Pharisees were rejecting Jesus. And everything they were saying was showing the reality of their hearts. They did not want Jesus. They did not believe in Jesus. And so to mock him, they said, you're just of the devil. That's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Christians don't do that. Christians are not going to do that. All who are members of Jesus' kingdom are no longer under the curse of sin and death. Well, let me put it another way. Didn't get much of a response there. You are no longer under the curse of sin and death. How do you feel about that? Isn't that better than Dak making a touchdown? Well, act like it. My, my. Yes. You are no longer under the curse of sin and death. Seriously. Jesus has forever bound the strong man. High five somebody. Seriously, stand up, stand up. Come on, everybody, stand up. Praise team, get up here. Stand up. Satan has been defeated. Satan has been defeated. We are not under the authority and power of the devil. Isn't that great? We belong to Christ. Yes, yes, yes. We belong to Christ. We don't have to be afraid of the devil. We are victorious. Because we are united with Christ. We are in Christ. Give your neighbor a hug and tell him, praise God, thank God for Jesus. <laughs>